Hey, good afternoon. We're talking about today, Grappling with Faith, A Journey of Surprises. I'm Rich Blue. I'm an adjunct faculty of the Wright Graduate University for the Realization of Human Potential. I'm also a psychotherapist and founder and spiritual director of Second Order Ministries, a, a supportive ministry to churches and pastors. Today, what we want to talk about is we want to talk about the role of faith in human and spiritual development. And so I'm going to share lessons from my doctoral research, as well as just from my own personal experience in working with people. So I wanted to start off talk, telling a story about Abraham. So Abraham is a famous patriarch, founder of three major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, a central figure and leader, and thought spoken of in the Bible as the founder of faith, the father of faith, and that he is um, considered also a friend of God. And his life is a wonderful example of a, a life of faith following a developmental model. And so what Abraham, the story I want to tell in the beginning, we'll talk about him later, but in the beginning, Abraham was, was spoken to by God and told to leave where he lived and leave his family. He lived in a place called Ur, U-R. That was the name of his city where he lived. And the command was to go. But God at that time spoke to him, in the, according to the story, and said to him to, to leave everything. And, but he didn't tell him where his destination was or how he was going to get there. And so the response to him was that he was willing and through fits and starts began to move and move away from that which was familiar and that which was comfortable. And this began this lifetime of following God. Now, I want to just qualify when I refer to God. So um, when I think of God, I think of the transcendent other. And I believe it's each of our responsibilities to decide who God is for us. So unfortunately for me, given my life experience and my age, I'm still going to refer to God probably with the he. But understand that the, I don't believe that God has a gender, and um, it's just going to be the way I refer to it. And the invitation to you with the topic of faith, because this is what's critical about this topic and the point of my research, was that faith relates to powerful living in all areas of life, not just religious or what we would deem to be spiritual. And it took me a long time to understand that. I sort of thought there was the spiritual side of life and then everything else. But faith is essential to, uh, to living a great life, and I think we'll see that. So I just want to kind of make that qualification. So God says to Abraham, leave Ur, and he follows and he goes. But the interesting that thing that happened was that what his faith was in, was in his confidence, was in his relationship with God and not in the clear instructions or any guarantees that had been given him. His life of faith was filled with challenges that demanded him to choose to move forward in the face of fear, doubt, hardship, and uncertainty. And his confidence, his faith, was in the nature of his relationship that we will see is evolving to what he called God. So my journey, I grew up in what I think of now as a mildly religious home. The focus was to basically be a good person and to follow the golden rule. That was about as far as it went for me. But what started to happen in my life is that I recognized that I was confused and I was searching. I was very focused, very dedicated, but the whole sum total of my you know, thing of life was really around excelling in sports. And really, at that time, I'd say my God was football. Without, I was without direction, and I was hungry for more meaning. So I was drawn to a number of people that were talking about having a relationship with Jesus. Now, I grew up around Berkeley, so I was a little suspicious. The language sounded pretty weird to me, even though I'd grown up in church. But what they were a part of was what was called the Jesus Movement. And it was an evangelical Christian movement in the 60s and 70s that started in the West Coast. And so these were a bunch of people that were having sort of this dynamic, experiential encounter with God and began to talk about it everywhere. And what happened for me is I was extremely drawn to the community and their acceptance, their, what I considered to be love and joy that they had in their lives. 
So at 16, I had an encounter with Christ. I had a personal, experiential, you know, what I think of as an encounter uh, with what I described as Jesus. And it shifted and changed the direction of my life. So what I want to, what, what we're going to talk about is the idea that faith is a developmental process, and each of us are going through a process in our own lives, having our own experiences from which they shape the direction of our life based on how we respond to those. So for me, it was something that began to be an organizing principle. Everything I did was related back to that. So I continued to be actively involved with sports. I was successful in that. I went in and got involved with the ministry. I worked with students. My wife and I um, uh, both were on staff with an organization that served as college chaplains. And I did that. I enjoyed that. We ended up having two kids. And then I um, decided that I wanted to move and become a counselor. And so I went back to school, and I pursued that. But Looking back, I can see that I was growing and developing, yet when I thought I should have arrived at a certain place, what I realized is that I was just beginning this wonderful journey. And I realized that I needed more help, more understanding, but I just didn't understand the nature of faith being a developmental process. So when I look back, I see some stages that happened in my life. And the first was, was that my faith was centered around a relationship. It was very relational. It was about connection. And I went through sort of like this honeymoon period with what I would have said, God. I went through this period where it just seemed like everything was flowing and wonderful. It was simple. It was all about just this simple, loving kind of thing. And in that Jesus movement, we, you know, we were called Jesus, you know, Jesus people or something, and often Jesus freaks. And I was fully into it, and I loved it. But then that period kind of changed, and I moved into what I call a season of striving. And the striving here initially was striving for knowledge. And in the evangelical Christian community, what, knowing the Bible and doing all those things was very critical and very important. And so I strove to acquire knowledge. And that went, then, that went for a while. And then what I noticed was a shift was I began to then move into service. And so I did that through the ministry, and then I did that through counseling. Um, what I was pursuing with the counseling was more the healing. I wanted to be involved in something that was more than education or training or those kind of things. So you could see my movement in that direction. Once I got involved with counseling, then what I was looking for was trying to integrate these two camps, because at that time they were very separate. You were sort of in the psychological camp or the scientific camp, or you were in the religious camp, the evangelical camp, and there, there wasn't much of a blending. So I saw my life as a journey of faith, a series of ups and downs, hardships, trials, and all kinds of things that resulted in my own development. But what began to shift is my own development focus moved from outside myself, knowledge, whatever it was, to more my own internal experience. And I began to recognize I was in trouble. Things were not working, but I didn't really have solutions again. This is very similar to where I was when I was in high school. And it was at that point that I got involved with Wright. And I began working with coaches and people to begin helping me understand at a deeper level. But when I did that, when I came there, I was, I'm almost sure, the only uh, evangelical Christian that was involved. If there were others, they hadn't come out at the time. And it was terrifying for me because most of my life I had been, I had stayed within this community that I didn't realize how narrow it was. So it was in the, with this process, what I be, was wrestling with was the idea, was, was Christ enough for me? And so I was leaving the fold. Now, what does this sound like? Sounds a little bit like Abraham, doesn't it? And he's leaving the familiar, he's leaving the comfortable. So when I, when I was leaving Ur, so to speak, was when I began to do personal growth work. And at that time, right, was pretty out there for me. I was a pretty conservative person, and we were doing all kinds of powerful things that were moving me, but they were focusing me on this internal uh, internal uh, state of what was going on. So I think of it a little bit like Daniel in the lion's den when I began doing this work because it was, it was, it was messy 
And I had been trained in so many ways. I'd been in seminary. I'd studied apologetics and all these kinds of things. But now the focus was not outside me. The focus was inside me. And what people were challenging me on was what did I really believe? Not what I had been taught, not what I thought, but a belief, a true belief, an authentic belief is reflected in how you live. And so I remember uh, Bob Wright saying to me, do you believe in a loving God? And I say, absolutely. And his question to me was, then why don't you love yourself? You see, those two didn't go. I remember, I, I still remember being terribly confused by why, how could you put those two together? There was this, this massive internal dis disconnect. And this was a, a major time of deconstruction for me. I, I was in this period of my development for years. Um, my fears were, would it destroy my faith? Would I abandon my Christian beliefs? Was I, you know, betraying God, betraying Christ? And um, what I began to see, though, was, was my God big enough to allow me to test and challenge what I believed? I think of it as the equivalent of a spiritual adolescence. And I began to go through this period where I was challenging, in a sense, everything that I had believed. And then I began to think, what is God really like? Not just all the studying I had done, what's he really like? And would he be the father of the prodigal son? The father of the prodigal son in that story welcomed him son going crazy, giving him the resources to go out and figure out what he wanted to do. And it involved him living this wild life. There was no punishment. There was no fear. There was just welcome for him in that. And I began to learn about uh, a man, uh, uh, one considered one of the most uh, 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 powerful theologians of the 20th century, his name was Paul Tillich, and he began to introduce this concept of the God above God, the God above God, the God that transcends the gods of our own understanding. And I realized that if God was afraid for me to explore and experience things, then that was a pretty small God. And this was one that was inviting me to move forward. So I began to move into new phases of my development. So it was a season of internal consciousness and awareness, and I was focusing on the truth, but it was different. It wasn't conceptual truth. It wasn't objective truth out there. It was internal truth. And I began to focus on transcendent principles and understanding things that were far greater than myself that involved learning how to deal with mystery. When I was younger, I wanted to understand everything and figure it out, and so it became a problem. So I want to talk a little bit about faith and defining it in terms of from my work. So faith comes from the Latin fidera, which means to trust. It is defined as confidence, reliance, and belief, especially without evidence or proof. That's a very important phrase, without evidence or proof. Faith is an essential component of both human and spiritual development. And it was in the, I use, in my research, we use the right developmental model as the template for being able to really understand how faith is critical at all stages of development. I saw faith as the response to an urge in human beings to continually be growing, evolving, and pursuing greater depth and consciousness. Faith involves the moment from, the movement from the known to the unknown, from certain to mystery. Faith is a muscle when exercised empowers individuals to make, sense, to make sense of and face the unknown, to exercise trust and mature in their next level of involve, next net level, excuse me, of development. And it involves courage. I define faith as an existential choice in the here and now to courageously move forward in the face of doubt and fear the unknowing, and exercising trust with certainty. So, some other elements of faith. Faith is more than belief. So a lot of people say, well, what's your faith? You know, or what, 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 what's your faith in? And what we began to realize in the research is faith is much more than the concepts in your head. It's the way you live. It's not a collection of thoughts or creeds or doctrines. Instead, it is used to be, you know, it represents the sum total of all we believe. Faith is not limited to religion or religious thought. Um, faith thrives in the world of spirituality. And religion, when you think of it, it's, sec it's security-based in control, knowing, certainty, creeds, and doctrines. 
Religion wants to control and wants people to conform. Faith in, in the realms of spirituality is more like the spirit. Spirit's like the wind. It blows wherever it wishes. You don't know where it's going. So the big idea is that authentic faith embraces fear and doubt. Um, we go back to the story of Abraham. What's very interesting is that Abraham's whole life was a series of these developmental steps. And at the end of his life, what God ended up asking them to do was to take his son, Isaac, that he had waited for his whole life. They finally conceived Isaac. He was promised to be the father of many nations, and he had no children. Sarah and Abraham did not have children. So they finally conceived when she was 90 and Abraham was 100. So pretty amazing, huh? Pretty, the, the, the steadfastness of his faith. But then when Isaac became a teenager, this, the next command that he got from God was to sacrifice his son, sacrifice him on an altar as an as a offering to God. Now that's bizarre to us today, obviously. Uh, there's a little bit more things they did, but you didn't sacrifice children. And so the interesting thing that happened with this is that Paul Tillich and Soren Kierkegaard were both existentialists. Gordon spoke about him previously. And, but they were Christian existentialists. So a lot of times existentialists were associated with atheism or whatever. But these were Christian existentialists focusing on our personal responsibility to choose how we are going to live our life and who we are going to be becoming. So in this moment, the thing that's so profound is Kierkegaard wrote this book called Fear and Trembling, and he wrote the whole book on unpacking the depth of Abraham's faith when, for many people, they look at that story and they walk away from religion because they think it's so disgusting. And on the surface, of course it is. Could there be anything worse than to murder your own son and to think that that was offering you know, uh, grace to God or something? It, it's just, there's absolutely no way. And so what Abraham did in that situation that, that Kierkegaard developed was he showed that no one in the world could have supported him in that decision. He could never, who in the world would have agreed that God had told him to do that? You'd think he was a lunatic. He should have been put in prison. But instead, the very fact, he didn't even tell his wife about it. He just went and took him and went three days, went up on this mountain, made an altar, he had his son carry the wood. Son goes, where's the offering? Hmm. Well, it's going to be you, but I'm not telling you that right now. Ties him up on this thing, gets ready to sacrifice him, and then the Spirit of God tells him to stop. There's a ram in the thicket. They offer it. That was what they did in those days. And it's this amazing story. But what makes it amazing was that only someone of that magnitude of faith could have had the, the confidence in the face of mystery and uncertainty to move forward and do something that no one on the planet would have given him the assurance that that was the right thing to do. And so you begin to recognize this man was, had an unbelievable relationship with God in the sense of learning, that in the sense of it's not moralistic. If you look at his life, he made all kinds of terrible mistakes. And, and in the Bible, many of the characters and the heroes of faith are just so human, they're delightful. But you see, it, he embraced fear. Can you imagine how afraid he was? Can you imagine the doubt he felt with that thing? But he kept moving forward. It demands courage. It's a willingness to live with uncertainty. Listen to what Till Tillich said about this. The, this element of, of uncertainty in faith cannot be removed. It must be accepted. Without uncertainty and the need for trust, there's no need for faith. And so today, faith is used to try for people to try to convince other people of certainty. But if you have certainty, it's not faith. And so the whole idea of is the invitation is for us to live these magnificent lives, but to do it, we must be willing to step into the unknown and act courageously. And at right, one of the principles that we use is we, one of the methodologies is, is in performative learning is we do the assignment way of living, which gives people the opportunity to have an experience of something that they would never otherwise have done on their own. And it's a perfect environment to be developing faith. Well, there's so much more to talk about in terms of that. Uh, the whole concept of bad faith, and it would just be so amazing to see uh, Bob Wright and Gordon Medlock did a fantastic paper. If you're more interested in that, please you know, reach out um, and we'll, we'll get that to you. But 
this is the thing I want to say about faith, and we'll close with this. Faith embraces doubt. Doubt is the companion of authentic faith. Doubt is faced in the willingness to move forward in the face of uncertainty and explains the need for courage for those who pursue a life of faith. You have to have courage. If you do not have fear, then you can't have courage. And so today, many people associate fear with that. So closing, closing um, quote from Paul Tillich, follow me with this. In those who rest on their unshakable faith, Pharisaism and fanaticism are the unmistakable symptoms of doubt which has been repressed. Doubt is not overcome by repression, but by courage. Courage does not deny that there is doubt, but it takes the doubt into itself as an expression of its own finitude and affirms the content of an ultimate concern. Courage does not need the safety of an unquestionable conviction. It includes the risk without which, without which no creative life is possible. So I hope today you have seen that this is just a, a taste of all these different elements of faith and how exciting it is to choose to live a, faith, a, a life by faith and to choose what you are going to be placing your faith in and going through that process. So if you're interested in more, reach out to us, reach out to write. You can um, look at uh, next steps could be you could um, read, you could sign up for one of the courses. You could look at my uh, request information like with my dissertation. You could also look at my book, uh, Surprised by God, A Journey of Divine Discoveries and um, blessings with you on your pursuit of faith. Mm -hmm.